Well, that's Norway done. Uh, there's a troll on my desk and a travel poster on the wall. Um, so the question is, should you go and see the Norwegian fjord? Yes, they're absolutely stunning. Should you do it by a cruise ship? No, and I'll explain why. This review is in two parts. First, I'll be talking about our experience on PMO Britannia. Um, any comparisons I make will be with Norella, as that's who we usually cruise with. The second part of the review is about the Norwegian fjords themselves and why a cruise probably isn't the best way to see them. When we booked this cruise, the headline cost was £549 per person, or just over £1,000, for a seven-night cruise, full board, inside cabin, which is excellent value. What this holiday actually cost us after the P&O's extras package, some weird balcony upgrading scheme, um, bidding process, shipboard expenses, um, tour shopping and everything else holiday related, our total spend was £2,338. Now, a quick search on the internet and three nights in Flam in May in a hotel with breakfast, flights from London and return train transfers from Bergen to Flam is £704 per person. Now this of course doesn't include food, drink and excursions and Norway is hellishly expensive but I'd argue this is a far better experience and I'll explain why at the end. So let's talk about the ship. <clears throat> so first of all the cabin uh, was a good size, um, lots of hanging space but a lack of drawers uh, with only one side having any uh, of the bed. Um, the side that had the drawers didn't have any power sockets either, um, and no USBs anywhere on the ship that we found. The bathroom was functional, pressure in the shower was good, um, but space to actually dry yourself was a bit tight. Um, the same can be said for the balcony, um, just enough room for a couple of chairs and a very small coffee table. The bed was comfortable, uh, more so than Morella. Um, we did have an issue with noise from chairs being moved on the deck above us. Hopefully you can hear that. We're in our cabin. It's not even six o'clock. So putting tables and chairs out on the deck above, marvellous. Um, also the overhang on the balcony uh, obstructs your view a bit um, and also limits the amount of sun you can get. So whatever you do, if you are getting a balcony, do not get one on a deck, which is probably why we got this in the bidding process. Public areas were plentiful. Uh, we never had much of an issue finding a seat. And again, the seating, nice and comfortable. Because of the size of the ship, it never felt crowded. But by the same token, it did feel a bit of a slog to get anywhere. Um, our cabin was near the rear and our favourite bowl was at the front. Dining was okay, um, not a great experience to be perfectly frank. Uh, menus in the included sit down restaurants lacked any choice and seemed to revolve around variations of a roast dinner. Even the top restaurant Epicurean was okay. Um, I felt that pre COVID it was the sort of thing you would expect in an included dining room. Um, meals themselves were not rushed. Um, in Epicurean, we were told it was going to take two to two and a half hours. Even in the main dining rooms, this would normally take a minimum of sort of 90 minutes. Although we never felt rushed on Morella, a sit-down meal could be completed almost half that time, if you wished. The other thing was the dining rooms felt a little cramped and dark. Um, we always tried and for the most part got a seat near the window. But by comparison to Morella's main dining room, um, the word dingy feels appropriate. Staff were okay. Um, what irked us the most, and not really the staff's fault, is the time it took to get a drink. Um, while they were great at taking an order, they would then have to take both your cards away. Uh, you then had to wait some time before your cards and a drink arrived back. And this happened everywhere at all locations. I think the issue here is the lack of hand scanners for the staff. Um, so they can just scan your card. I don't know if this is... I don't know if the system they use on PMO is specific to that company or if it's the same across all the cruise lines under the Carnival Group. Um, one barman unprompted was complaining bitterly about the cuts in staff uh, and the management making decisions about jobs they had no idea how to do, um, which is an old song from Foot Soldiers from the beginning of time. 
doesn't make it an invalid point though. Speaking to people on board who are p &O regulars, a few things were apparent. So number one, standards have dropped in service, food and overall experience. Now to be fair, I think this is the same across the cruising industry. As companies mothballed operations for two years, laid off experienced staff, um, they've all got to try and re-recruit and they've all got to try and recoup those losses. We certainly know it's a difference on Morella pre and post COVID. Uh, number two, p and are a good choice if you have mobility issues and live in the UK. Now this is obvious when you think about it. If you sail and return to Southampton, um, that's going to be much easier than having to negotiate an airport. Number three, the loyalty program locks you in. Um, this is, of course, our point of a loyalty programme. You're always working towards your next perk or tier. Um, and if you are getting 5 to 10% discount, um, especially on your next cruise, that's a fairly big saving to um, give up. So on the plus side, large, comfortable, and can be very cheap if you don't want anything fizzy or alcoholic, um, and you are just happy to eat in the buffet uh, and the included dining. Now, on the downside, as soon as you stray from the basics, the costs rack up. You can smuggle on your own alcohol and soft drinks, um, but to us, that's not really a holiday. Um, I just want a glass of wine with my meal and an occasional cocktail. I certainly don't want to have to put wine I've smuggled on board into a sports bottle, which is apparently what people do and walk around with it. Um, ultimately, the overall experience was about the same as Morella. Um, and the positives of the P&O cruise don't make up for the better food choice on Morella and the more relaxing feeling brought about by the all-inclusive nature of the Morella experience. So Morella for us over P&O. One other thing, um, I don't know if it's on all cruise ships, but you cannot take a drone on any ship in the Carnival group. Uh, now this is in the small pin, uh, as a security guard admitted, very small print. Um, mine didn't get taken at Southampton, even though it was in our hand luggage. Um, although, again, according to the security chief, uh, if they do take it at Southampton, they either destroy it or you have to pay for it to be shipped back to your home address. It did get confiscated once we got off the ship and then tried to get back on with it. Um, in total, they confiscated six drones on this cruise. Um, and then you get it back at the end of the cruise. Um, I wasn't angry with the staff, it's not their fault at the end of the day, but uh, apparently people do get rather upset when uh, the drone gets taken. So let's look at the itinerary. So this was a seven night cruise, as I've said. There are only four stops, which was Stravanger, Oldham, Flam and Hooks. And two sea days, one at the beginning, one at the end. The one at the end was a bit superfluous. Um, the itinerary did show various cruise buys of fjords, but they're all late at night and a bit pointless, quite frankly. So our first stop was Stravanger. Now this is Norway's fourth largest city, uh, as the commentary on the hop on hop off bus kept informing us. Uh, now this cost 33 pounds and 50 pence per person and was a complete waste of money. Um, you can walk to the various sites it visits and it's all sort of fairly compact around the harbor. Now this may be a bit controversial, but for us, there's nothing architecturally pleasing about Norway, sorry, Norway. Um, it's functional, which it's going to be in those sort of climbs, um, but I didn't get my camera out once on the ride on the bus. Um, what was worth doing for us was getting a smallish boat ride out to um, Lysfjorden, £54 per person. Um, this took about three hours and it's what we should have done in the first place rather than the bus. Our next stop was at Olden. Um, now, this was in the heart of the fjords, and this gave us our first bit of disquiet about taking a cruise ship to Norway. Um, as you chug through the beautiful landscape in what is effectively a large tower block on its side pumping out fumes, you can perfectly understand why they are going to ban them. Um, this is further emphasised when you dock in what looks like a small village with, a, I think, a population of around 500 people and 3,000 plus people disgorge into the area while smoke comes out of the funnels and just hangs in the air. It's not a pleasant sight. Um, so here we decided to either do the Skylift or Brickstall Glacier, and we decided on the Glacier in the end. We got off the ship, went to the tourist office on the dock, bought a ticket for a coach, which was £37 per person, and went straight to the Glacier. Um, again, half the price of what P&O wanted. 
once coach drops you off, you've got about three hours to walk the two and a half kilometers um, and back to the glacier. You can get a lift to within 600 meters. I think this is about another 30 pounds, but if you can manage a walk, would highly recommend it. Um, seeing what's left of the glacier and passing various signs as you walk along, uh, you know, in 1800, this is where the glacier was, etc. Again, gives you a, a further emphasis of an easiness about visiting the fjords in a cruise ship. Um, now, Flam was our next stop. I think Britannia is the largest cruise ship and get to Flam. I'm, I'm not too sure. Seems to be quite a lot you can do here. This was our favourite stop. Um, there was a lot more tourist type shops and activities and tours. Um, and it even had a couple of hotels, which is what I looked up earlier. Um, again, when we got off here, we went straight to the train station and bought tickets for the Flam Railway, which was £51 per person, half the price of p &O. But the advantage of this, not only cost savings, is they seem to lay on a, a special train for the cruise company and it was rammed. Whilst ours had plenty of room, you could go from side to side on the carriages, depending on what the best view was. Um, the whole thing takes two hours, absolutely stunning, highly recommend it. Our last stop was Hoogsund. Um, I'm not sure what the point of this was. Now, uh, to be fair to Herringtown, um, we didn't see it at its best. It was constantly raining uh, and that never helps anywhere. Um, we bought tickets for a land train. Uh, we used cash for this. Now, you don't get any change if you use cash, something to be aware of. Um, we had a drive around, various herring related facts. Again, nothing particularly interesting. And we jumped off in the shops, which was nothing to keep us hooked there, really. We even had trouble trying to find a, a decent coffee shop. Um, if you do visit here, I would recommend going to uh, a reconstructed Viking village. That would probably be a time best uh, spent there. So, as I said at the start, Norwegian Fjords should be on your bucket list beautiful um but they do get a bit samey uh, by the end of the second day we were both sarcastically saying to each other oh look another waterfall um and as i review the pictures i've taken i'm struggling to distinguish which fjord we were in when i took them um for us cruise is a taster menu you visit places with an eye to see if you might want to go back and explore some more um and i don't feel the need to go back to norway so if you are going to do this do it as a land-based thing um, you'll get a far richer experience, it'll be less environmentally impactive, and you'll put more money into the local economy. As for P&O itself, it can be very good value, um, especially if you like the whole cruising life thing and are particularly interested in the itinerary. But you do have to be disciplined about that. And I don't go on holiday to be disciplined. So P&O, not for us. In fact, as far as European cruising is concerned, we're, we're probably done. We've had quite a few good trips. Our next trip will be to Vienna. Um, so join us for that. And we're planning a big adventure in the new year. So that should be fun. Thanks for watching.